let's get started. at Cisco, and I want to welcome all of you to the special edition of Women IT Rock. Uh, it's a live broadcast, and at Cisco, we are a global company, so we have a follow the sun model. Uh, so Emma Reed and your team, thank you for doing this, and Jana Lacalzi is from Rome. They're joining us today. Uh, Emma has literally been up all night following the sun. Today, we're celebrating International Girls and in ICT Day. So we've been very excited about this because this year we have over 40,000 people who are joining us globally. And here in the US and Canada, we have over 4,000 people. So thank you for joining us. Uh, this is probably then the largest Women Rock IT broadcast ever. And um, a lot of that is attributed to our employees who around the globe volunteer it, you know, many, many times throughout the year in terms of connecting with young women and girls and helping them to be a part of the technology industry and more importantly, to become leaders in the industry. Uh, we have two very special guest speakers, but before I do that, I have a few housekeeping things that I think you'd be interested in. Uh, so the first thing is, is that uh, there will be a survey. Um, and you can complete it at the end of the broadcast. And the reason we do surveys is that we want to constantly improve our programming and ensure that it's meaningful and relevant to all of you. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, there's a little incentive. It's a virtual gift bag. And if you do fill out the survey, which will be available at the end of the broadcast, uh, you will be able to get that uh, virtual gift bag and the goodies that are in there. Uh, the second part of this is that there is also a passport, a career passport, and uh, there's avatars that go with it. And so, uh, again, this won't be available until the end of the broadcast, but uh, if you attend a, a five broadcasts, you can actually con uh, accumulate five avatars and you can personalize this. It's all about your career journey. Um, and if you do that and you get all five, uh, you will be entered into uh, a raffle and have an opportunity to meet one of these amazing women uh, who have presented uh, at Women Rock IT events. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we are all about tools to help women and girls be successful. So what you will find is that because you participated in this, you have the ability to access our free online courses that's offered by our Cisco Networking Academy program. So it's everything from introduction to cybersecurity, network essentials, the introduction to IoT, the Internet of Things, um, some programming essentials to Python, Linux essentials, as well as entrepreneurship. So, uh, you know, feel free to, uh, to access those and, and put those courses to work for you uh, as soon as this broadcast is over. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud about Cisco is that we had a focus on gender uh, for a very long time, at least 20 years. And the reason is, is that uh, the importance of women and girls unlock opportunities for entire families and communities. Uh, and it's one that with the Network Academy program in 2001, I actually got, 2002, I actually uh, went to Afghanistan and opened the first Network Academy program at Kabul University. And after the first semester, the lowest score was a 94. And what was beautiful about this was that you couldn't say they did okay for a least developed country because the certification for Network Academy is global. So you could be in a remote village in Africa or in one of the top tech schools in New York City, and it wouldn't matter. If you did well and acquired the certification, it was a sign that you could compete globally. Um, the other reason that we have to continue to really focus on this is that it is a life uh, a lifeline. If you think about everything in our lives, whether it's healthcare, 
government services, education, jobs, skills, all the things that we need to be able to survive and help our, our families and our communities thrive, it is all going to be online. And when you think about the quality of the services that you get that are tailored to the special needs and ambitions of people in different community, it is really important that women and girls can participate, not only in accessing these services and accessing these skills, but in terms of leading and helping to shape that. So with that, we're very excited to have two very special women with us, uh, Marita Chang and Emily Kennedy. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Marita. She's the founder and CEO of a company called Abut, Abut um, and as she explained it to me, it's not mine, it's not yours, it's ours. And she's also uh, an advisor to RoboGals, and basically uh, what they do, it's a riff on robots and gals. Um, she's very clever uh, with, <laughs> with these words. Uh, she's a very special person and very accomplished. Uh, she has a degree in, in metatronics and computer science. Uh, she's a member, I mean, more than I could have done in my whole life. She has accomplished uh, very early in her. She's a member of the Order of Australia. She's a Young Australian of the Year in 2012 and one of Forbes' top 50 women in tech in 2018. Uh, so with that, Marita, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, so happy to be here with everyone and share in this special day with everyone and share my story and tell you a bit about the things that I've done in my career so far. Um, so to start off, I was born in Cairns in far north Queensland, Australia, and now I, I live in San Francisco. Um, but yeah, Cairns is a tropical paradise where Finding Nemo is from, so I highly recommend you go and check that out one day. Um, I had a really relatively normal childhood, um, doing things like Chinese line dancing uh, for the community, um, swimming, soccer, um, just various like extracurricular activities. Mum wanted me to be exposed to lots of things and just learn about different fields so that I could uh, take whatever I learned from those fields into whatever I do in the future. And that's what you're doing here today. You're learning a bit about me and a bit about Emily so that you can take what you learn into whatever projects or ideas you want to implement in the future. And so I, I love reading um, and I read this book and instantly I, I just fell in love with reading. Um, and actually before this, I wasn't very good at languages at all. My mom spoke to me in Cantonese. Uh, she had me learning Japanese and Mandarin lessons. Um, so when the teacher spoke English at school, I didn't really know what she was saying. So I was very confused all the time as a, as a child trying to juggle these four languages. Um, but after reading this book, I fell in love with reading and just would spend hours and hours a day reading everything that I could get my hands on. Despite my love of reading though, I knew that I wanted a career in science and technology because I, I thought, well, maths and science, that's like a universal language and you can transcend um, all, all of these uh, other other languages. Um, and so I read my brother's old editions of Time Magazine growing up and I was really inspired by the Google guys and how they were in their early 20s, dropped out of university to found Google, really inspired by um, the Apple guys, uh, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, 21, 25, when they co-founded Apple. And it made me think, even though I'm young, like these guys, they're they, they were young, they didn't have any money, they didn't have like um, PhDs, they didn't have decades of experience. And so that made me think, it doesn't matter if I'm young, like I can still do something if I if I apply my passion and my grit and, and, um, and have big ideas and dream big. And so um, in year 12, I signed up for engineering camp uh, over four days. We got to build robots out of Lego, shoot water rockets into the sky and make these um, ping pong catapult uh, devices and I had so much fun learning about all the opportunities with engineering that I could travel the world that I could work on problems that would impact millions of people's lives um, and how they live and work every day uh, it just seems so exciting to be able to use my maths and science to solve real problems in the world but my mom wanted me to do medicine because I'm because I'm Asian and so as soon as I finished high school, I went to um, went down to Melbourne, a major city in Australia, and um, and I did my medicine interview. And they said, um, 
here's a scenario, respond to it. John wants to study history, but his parents want him to do law. What should John do? And so I sat in my seat and I squirmed uncomfortably and I said, John should study history because that's what he's passionate about. And as soon as I was out of the room, I called my mom and I said, I'm doing engineering and that's that. Uh, uh, there were only um, two other girls out of my high school of 200 who went on to study engineering straight out of high school. I thought that because my hometown of Cairns was such a small and remote place um, that when I got to the big city uh, where my university was, There'll be heaps of people, including lots of girls, just as passionate about engineering as I am. I was really surprised when it's, instead it took me until the end of my first semester at university before I found uh, the four other girls doing my course of mechatronics engineering and computer science. Basically, that means that we all wanted to learn how to build robots and program them. In my second year at university, I decided to do something about this. Um, the head of, I approached the head of the electrical engineering department because I wanted to build a robot with my friends. And he said he was interested in getting some students together to go to school and teach his six girls robotics to get them interested in engineering. I went away and thought, wow, I could actually make a difference to the number of girls in my class. And I thought, if, we, if we're going out to one school, why don't we just go out to all the schools? And so I wrote up a plan for that to happen. I um, recruited 25 of my friends, uh, three of them showed up, and together we started designing robotics workshops, calling schools, and recruiting even more people to join us. And in the first uh, three weeks, we had 60 people join us in our endeavor. And uh, that's how RoboGals was founded. We go out to schools with Lego robots and teach girls how to build and program them while telling them all about engineers and all about the opportunities uh, and exciting careers that you can pursue around the world through engineering. In the first three months, we taught 124 girls from five schools in Melbourne. And after that time, I left RoboGals Melbourne to run without me and went overseas to London to study mechanical engineering at Imperial College London for a year. Before going there, I thought it'd be so cool to have RoboGals in the UK, then we could be global. Um, but London was so big and I, I didn't know where to begin. After about three months there, I realized there was nothing like RoboGals in the UK. And um, there were 15 girls out of 150 in my mechanical engineering class, four out of 120 in computer science, two out of 70 in aerospace engineering. And so I decided if I wanted to make a difference to the young girls in London, I would need to be the one to do it. No one showed up to the first RoboGals meeting in the UK. And so after about half an hour, when I realized this, I cried. And then I messaged everyone again and said, hey, hey, uh, hey, let's meet up tomorrow. I noticed you missed today's meeting. And again, no one showed up. Um, but I realized I realized after about 15 minutes and I, I cried again, but I cried a little less because I was growing resilient. Um, and then I thought, you know, if this isn't really working. How can I how can I get people to show up? And so I emailed everyone who said they were interested again and said, hey, when are you, when are you, when are you actually free? Um, and um, we set up a meeting the week after and um, and uh, four people showed up. Um, and after that, I managed to recruit even more people to join us in our cause uh, to keep Rubber Gals in London running while I returned back to Australia. While I was over in the UK, I noticed that there were a lot of um, events for national societies because the UK is so tiny, it's really cheap and easy to get around. And so I decided I wanted to do the same for RoboGals. And so I, I invited six female engineering students from uh, four other universities around Australia to Melbourne for three days to learn all about starting up their own RoboGals chapter. Uh, but more importantly, uh, it enabled people to be friends and meet like-minded people from all over the country. So at our first conference, we had 20 young women from um, four other universities and they learned all about RoboGals, went back to their uh, hometown universities and started up their own chapters there. And that was so successful that uh, five months later, I returned to the UK and we expanded to another five chapters in the UK. And since then, we've held, um, we've expanded and held events all over the world. Uh, we teach our lessons around um, real world problems, uh, we give it real world stories so that they can understand how the robotics they're doing in the classroom relates to the real world. And we mentor girls into robotics competitions, we hold our own competitions for girls all over the world, 
Um, we go out to rural and regional areas and teach boys and girls. Uh, and a uh, really cool story is our Cal Caltech chapter. Um, they were at a they had a booth and um, some executives came up to them and said, oh, this is very interesting. And as a result, they were invited to consult with Disney Pixar on a film about Tinkerbell, the first engineer. And so I think that's really exciting. And it just goes to show you that if you um, just put your hand up and do things that you're interested in, then opportunities that you could have never imagined come your way. And so we've held our conferences all over London, Sydney, um, Manchester, Adelaide, uh, Brisbane, um, Pasadena, uh, New York, Canada. Um, our con we have three conferences a year now in Asia Pacific, Europe and North America. Um, and they attract people from all over the world, um, all getting together uh, to think about strategies to get girls interested in engineering and making friends around the world. And so now we have um, chapters in 13 countries around the world, um, over 30 over 30 chapters. We've taught over 120,000 girls at robotics workshops. Um, and for all the, those efforts, I was named the 2012 Youngest Round of the Year. So I get invited to speak all over the world about uh, my journey with RoboGals, but also about all the projects that I've worked on since then. And so after that year of being Youngest Round of the Year, I thought I don't want to just tell girls that they can do anything with engineering. I want to show them that they can do anything with engineering. And so um, my friends and I, we decided to create iPoly together. Uh, so iPoly um, actually um, is an app that enables young people to recognize objects uh, in their everyday life. And so um, this app can actually recognize um, eight images a second. And all you have to do is point your phone somewhere and it'll tell you what you're looking at. And so it's really helpful to a blind person. It recognizes over 5,000 everyday objects. And uh, this, this user is very happy. He's like, wow, that's all right. That's that's like magic. Um, and that's what we're trying to create, a magical experience for our users where um, they, they could have access to something that they never um, had access to before. So we went and visited blind organizations all over um, California and all over Silicon Valley. Um, and they said, oh, wow. Um, I never knew what that painting was in this office. And this app has told me uh, I I was too embarrassed to ask people what was on the wall. Um, we had blind schools all over the world message us and say the, that they'd be teaching it in their classes. And the girls in particular really liked it because they were using it to go to the bathroom and um, and tell the the basin apart from the toilet, apart from the waste um, basket. And so that made for a much more hygienic experience uh, in the bathroom. So you can recognize um, uh, colors and, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't always get it right, but um, but it, because it recognizes things so quickly, um, it, it, it gives a lot of input. Um, and so this this is one of our users saying that he'll just love to take this and explore. It will be so cool and just see what I find. Um, and so what makes iPoly really special is uh, we created it at, at the beginning um, of, of of the craze um, when when this kind of technology wasn't as common. And uh, the other thing that makes it really special is that all the processing is actually done on real time um, on the phone. And so it means that if you're, in, in, a, if you're in, an, in an area that doesn't have good internet or Wi-Fi, um, you can still use this technology. And um, so you can use it at the bottom of the ocean, you can use it in space, um, you can use it, it even in Australia is what I like to say when I, when I was in Australia. And so this is a founding team. Um, yeah, Alberto from Italy, uh, Simon from Sweden, and we got some office space from Engineers Australia in Melbourne. We grabbed, we got some people together to help us build the technology. We launched it at the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, showed it to the president of Italy, and um, and you know now we've um, processed over two billion images, and we've had over five hundred thousand downloads in 26 languages. Um, so all these people who are visually impaired have, have used this technology um, in order to recognize things and, and make their lives just a little bit easier. Uh, after that, we thought, how, how else can we use this technology to um, benefit people? Uh, and so we thought about tourism and um, identifying different artifacts and um, having the app tell you what those things are. Um, or uh, we, we also worked with um, food appliance companies uh, in terms of smart fridges and smart um, microwaves and microwave ov ovens. Uh, and then we decided to do some work in um, smart supermarkets. So having uh, the, the cameras track um, different products in the store. Um, and that that way, 
you can walk into the store, scan your phone um, to let them the store know that you're there. Um, grab all the items that you want from the shelves, uh, put them in your basket, and then just walk out. And uh, with all the cameras tracking what products you've touched and um, what products you've taken, um, when you leave the store, the uh, the app can then deduct the amount that you've uh, purchased uh, from your bank account, and then you can just get on your way without needing to um, go and line up and, and pay. And so it, it means that uh, it, it's just a much more seamless uh, uh, interaction. Uh, so yeah, we're experimenting here with uh, trying to trick the cameras, but the cameras aren't aren't being tricked, and um, they they can see customer zero wherever he goes. So um, yeah, after after working with this team, um, then trying all these different ideas, uh, I decided to go back to my original love of robotics, and uh, I thought, what's the simplest robot that I could build that would be useful to people? Um, and I thought, well, a telepresence robot. So a telepresence robot enables you to be in multiple places at the same time. So you could be um, at home, uh, like we've all been during the pandemic, and you could have a robot in the office, lab, warehouse, factory. Um, so remotely, you can drive this robot around and be effective in multiple places and have a presence there. And so I got some friends together. We built the first version. Um, that box there charges it. And then um, this is our first user interface. And uh, I had an 82-year-old mentor who saw me build this robot and said, now that I've seen how you work, I'm going to show you how to do things properly. And so um, she had mentored me into building our second version, which we showcased on stage at the Sydney Opera House. At, at, uh, and uh, now our robot is like, um, in order to uh, for example, buying to go outside and work with his carer on different projects. Um, if his parents if the parents want to call him, then they can just dial into the robot, drive around, and they know what's happening at home. They don't need to ask as many questions. Uh, this is a closer, uh, quicker connection. Um, so we've got lots of use cases like that in education, around the office. Um, and currently, our latest iteration of the control interface, you can see yourself, you can see the ground, make sure you don't drive into anything. It's like playing um, Mario Brothers, except if you drive it off a cliff, you have to buy a new robot. And we have an iPhone and Android app as well, um, and customers all over Australia. And uh, this is a video of us building our first robots uh, to ship out to our customers. And there they are. Um, and then following on from that, we thought, what, what else can we do to add value? Um, and we thought of our customers and uh, how a lot of our customers um, have a disability, and so we decided to uh, create a brain control interface so that people with a disability could uh, control this robot um, to go to work remotely or go to a museum. And this is Anthony, 36, and uh, he's going to try brain control. Um, yeah, he here he is explaining um, about uh, his uh, his his situation. Anthony's a great sport. He loves he loves uh, trying these things and um, using our robots. So as you can see, he's it's being explained to him how to use this. So I'll, I'll let you read the the text so you can see what they're saying. So yeah, they, they're using um, their brains to control the robot remotely, uh, to drive it around, say hi to people. Um, like I said they could go exploring the museum and or go and see the polar bears in the Arctic. Uh, it's basically yeah, making these uh, making people with disabilities um, superheroes, giving them another ability that's like beyond what humans are capable of. Um, because humans aren't able to do this, we're not able to be in multiple places simultaneously. So these robots are um, used by people with long-term illness to go to uh, work remotely or um, kids with a disability to go to school remotely. Um, and yeah, we have, we have customers around Australia who use our robots for, for that use case.
And uh, then we, um, uh, following on from that, I thought, who else could I impact? Who else could I empower? Um, and I thought about Rob. Uh, so he used to be a, a farmer and uh, he fell out of his lightweight helicopter um, when, when he was surveying his cattle and he broke his spinal cord from his neck down. And so that means that Rob can't um, move his arms or legs that much. He can only move his hand about this much. So he can't scratch his eyebrow or touch his wife's hand or um, or, or pat his dog. Um, and so I went around and interviewed 200 people with a disability um, and asked them, how could I help? Um, what could I do? And um, they said, if I was to build a robot arm, it, it should be aesthetic. And so we gave Jiva these curves. Um, they said it should be discreet. And so we made it easy to pack away Jiva by the side of someone's wheelchair. And uh, they said it should be functional. So we gave the Jiva a control interface to move around, um, a shortcut system, um, and lots of uh, different settings so that they could program it how they like. Um, and um, we, we also gave a, the ability to program Jiva to do tasks. Um, so you could program Jiva to have a spoon in the hand um, and then say position one is spoon and bowl, position two is spoon in front of someone's mouth, and position three is really, really close to someone's mouth. So someone could um, play on repeat really quickly, really hungry, um, or they could pause it if they want to chat to their friends or family um, or stop it if, if the food is too hot. Uh, and uh, this here, we, we're showing the shortcut system where the ribbon arm is by the side of someone's wheelchair. And uh, rather than doing all the navigation to get the ribbon arm to the object, um, our shortcut system um, has a grid formation where you can just reach out um, and where you can just press two buttons and the ribbon arm will reach out in the general area that you've uh, told it to reach out to uh, in the program. Um, the other exciting thing is um, uh, someone with a disability could teach this ribbon arm uh, how to draw a symbol or a sign. Um, and so when they're at the post office, rather than putting a pencil in, in their mouth and drawing a cross sign, uh, Jiva can draw uh, that symbol again and again at the bank or at the post office um, to represent them. And so with this kind of technology, uh, it means that people like Rob are able to uh, pick their hat up off the ground. Um, they're able to pat their dog. Um, they're able to open the gate and be an independent farmer. Um, and so following on from all this technology, I what I really wanted to do and was really entranced by when I was younger was um, making robots that could live amongst us and help everyone in their day-to-day day -day lives. And so I thought, well, why not put this robot arm on the teleport, telepresence robot, and then we could have a, a robot arm um, that's accessible to everyone because this robot arm has a platform to move around and, and do things. Um, and so we created Jiva Roo, a combination of Jiva and, uh, and Teleport. Um, it's got a um, movable base. Um, it's got um, an arm that can move around. Um, it can lift um, It can lift like three kilos um, at full extension. So uh, it can lift a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> this is some tests that we're doing. Um, so yeah, the base can move around, um, the, the, the neck can move around, the limb can move around. So what makes it really special is it's, it's got eight degrees of freedom, um, which is more maneuverability than a human arm. And um, yeah, it's great lifting capacity, um, very solid. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's a very, very exciting project. Um, you can control it using an Xbox controller. Uh, and currently we're doing usability trials uh, it, it, in um, in our office where we, we invite people to come into our office um, every week and uh, we're, we're testing this robot with um, with hundreds of people in order to uh, get feedback and uh, improve it and uh, improve our control interfaces um, and, and bring this robot to the next stage of production. And the next stage is to actually uh, put a cover on this robot arm um, and um, shoot some some videos to show the different use cases so that people can really imagine how this could play a role in their lives. So that's a few of my projects. Um, uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening and um, back to you. 
Thank you, Marita. That was amazing. And we have some interesting questions coming through. I've also been taking some notes, so we'll be able to um, do a QA uh, with both our speakers at the end. Next, I'd like to introduce Emily Kennedy, and she is the president and co founder of Marinus Analytics. And what they do is they use um, AI and machine learning in order to help prevent human trafficking. And there's about 200 law enforcement agencies who actually use your technology. Um, Marinus was actually uh, awarded the 2019 Tech Pioneer uh, or, and stated as one at the World Economic Forum. Um, she, it's, it's very interesting. You would think that she has a technology degree specifically, but what's very what's important about technology is that you need to integrate other things with it, such as ethics. And hers is an ethics history and public policy from Carnegie Mellon. And again, just like Marita, uh, they have done more in their uh, first, you know, first trimester of their lives than uh, I've done in my entire life. Uh, she's a Forbes 30 under 30. She's also Toyota's mother of invention and one of entrepreneurs' most powerful women. So with that, Emily, take it away. Fantastic. Tay, thank you so much. Um, as she said, I'm Emily Kennedy, and today I'm going to share my journey of building AI for good. It's really all about uh, my journey has been about tech and how do we create it and shape it so that it makes a good social impact. So the next slide just shows a little bit about me. As Tay said, I'm president and co-founder of Marinus Analytics, and I built this AI company from the ground up pretty much straight out of college to fight human trafficking through our software called Traffic Jam, which I'm going to share through this a little bit about how it came to be and kind of the journey. But Traffic Jam has grown to be deployed to law enforcement for human trafficking investigations across the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. And as I said, I was a humanities student. So that's going to kind of come into my talk um, about you know, how do you make a difference with the skills that you have and, and how can you dig into technology to make a difference? So before we get into all of that, I just wanted to show a quick video summarizing what we do in my journey. Human trafficking is all around us. It's in every city, every socioeconomic level, and it's because it's a really lucrative industry. These victims are all over the place and you may look and not even know that you're seeing one. Traffic Jam is a suite of artificial intelligence tools that are used by detectives all across the world to fight human trafficking. The internet has really changed the game for how traffickers do what they do. Now they're advertising online and this allows the traffickers a much broader audience to advertise. Analysts and detectives tell us that they may be looking for a specific victim. And in the past, they would actually print out a photo of the victim, tape it to their computer screen, and manually scroll down through all the information. And it takes a lot of time. We wanted to find a solution, and so we finally found algorithms that worked for our data. We've had many success stories. My first contact with human trafficking came when I was traveling through Eastern Europe at the age of 16. We saw some children on the, the street. One of our friends who was with us, who was from that area, said, these children are trafficked by the Russian mob to beg on the street. And if they don't come home with enough money, uh, they would be punished. And so that really hit me hard that children my age and younger were exploited like that. I remember the specific moment when I was at Carnegie Mellon as a student walking down the street in Pittsburgh in the snow and I thought, okay, I have to do this senior honors thesis on human trafficking. We decided to spin out of the university into our company, Marinus Analytics, in order to scale these tools up and make them really easy to use. I've always, from the beginning, thought that if we can assist with the rescue of one victim, that makes all of our work worth it. So as you heard just there in that quick video, this whole journey really all started from that trip at 16. Just, uh, you know, growing up in a really good family and kind of a sheltered life, you know, when I saw, wow, there's these really young children, younger than me, 
who seem to be their orphans. They don't have someone looking out for them and they're actually exploited. So that really planted a seed in my heart at that age. But the thing was, I didn't really know what I could do about it. I knew I cared about the issue, but I didn't know if I had skills, what would a job be that would help fight human trafficking. So there were many years where I just kept that uh, kind of passion for that issue in my heart. And it really started to come together when I got into college at Carnegie Mellon University. So I started, obviously I said it before I was a humanities major, and um, at that time, a lot of it was very much a timing thing that sex trafficking in particular in the United States had started to move from the streets to online. So rather than victims being on a certain street in a certain neighborhood where people would come and buy them, those victims were being advertised online for sex and being exploited. And so I was really interested in this as a policy student and when I learned about that online element, it started to make me think, OK, if there's all this data on the Internet. What if we could actually use that to help find victims? And so that was kind of the kernel that started it all. And uh, first, I finished my senior honors thesis, which basically laid the groundwork for our software traffic jam now looking at, you know, how talking to detectives, talking to FBI agents about how do you look for these victims and how can we help use the data to help find them. And so once I finished my thesis, I was hired as a research analyst at the same lab where I started that work at CMU at Carnegie Mellon and continue to kind of just dig into these questions, play around with the data in the lab and start to try to understand how we might solve this problem, kind of reverse engineer the process that the detectives had. And so uh, after my job, I worked as a research analyst full time for one to two years, and we ended up creating a prototype of traffic jam in the lab. And so it started to really take shape. And again, it wasn't with the expectation that it would grow to the level that it's grown now. But what ended up happening was we started getting calls from detectives all across the United States saying, I heard you have this tool. Can you help me on my human trafficking investigation? And of course I said yes. And as that started to happen more and more, we realized the importance of putting the software tool into their hands. We didn't want to be the bottleneck. We wanted to be able to expand and scale our impact. Um, and so we launched our company, Marinus Analytics, in 2014 to do that. And on the next slide, it just shares a little bit about kind of what we do, our mission, which is to create AI solutions that equip these frontline workers like those human trafficking detectives to protect the vulnerable and end systemic exploitation. And we solve problems not just in the areas of human tra trafficking now, um, although we've worked in that area for uh, about six years as a company and then some years before that, but now we also work in areas of preventing child abuse and cyber fraud, which I'll share about towards the end. Um, and the impact we've had so far has really been huge and way more than I ever expected. So we saved about 70,000 investigative hours by use, the use of Traffic Jam last year alone. Um, and you can imagine that time savings and how much it accelerates the detective's ability to find and locate and recover victims. And we've assisted in the recovery of thousands of victims. So we're really proud of those numbers, but you know those are just kind of abstract numbers. And so I really wanted to share just one story that kind of exemplifies why this mission is so important and why we need technology to help. It all started when Allie reached out for help. She was desperately trying to escape her abusive trafficker, a man named Julian. And she claimed that he was trafficking a large group of women for sex, including minors, underage girls. And the man she reached out to was Detective Patterson. He's a human trafficking investigator from the state of Texas. And he is one of the best detectives I know. He looks for these children as if they were his own children. And when Detective Patterson started working the case, he found that Julian had a history of unthinkable violence against these women. He had run over victims with his car, strangled girls till they passed out, trapped them in his house, starved them, and he even threatened to hurt one girl's baby if she wouldn't work for him. 
he would set a $1,500 a day quota for each girl. And if they ever came home without that money, he would beat them. He was easily making from them over a quarter of a million dollars a year. You see, over the years, we've gotten glimpses into the horrors that sex trafficking victims face every single day. We've seen cases where girls were kept in dog crates when they weren't with customers and large criminal organizations trafficking women internationally to thousands of buyers, both scenarios where artificial intelligence was successful in assisting in the recovery of victims and the takedown of their exploiters. But cases like Ali's demonstrate just how hard, if not impossible, it would have been to bring justice without the help of artificial intelligence. So what does Traffic Jam do? Well, tra Traffic Jam is basically a suite of investigative tools, AI-based tools, to help law enforcement find and recover victims. So it includes and deploys many different types of AI, including some that you see here. So simple search to query phone numbers of known victims when maybe a family reaches out to a detective and says, our daughter, we think she's trafficked for sex and here's her cell phone number to find historical breadcrumbs that can actually back up the stories of victims, even in court, which is extremely helpful. And then we have tools like pattern recognition that can identify across millions of images when the same hotel bedspread was seen across multiple photos, helping to identify, for instance, when there's multiple victims advertised in the same room or against the same hotel bedspread. Then we have things like juvenile leads. So when we review these images, we can estimate the age to bring potential juvenile leads to the surface and to the detective's attention. So our goal is never to replace the detective. The goal is to narrow down the information that they need to manually process. Because of course, we as humans can only manually read through so much information. So the goal of pretty much all of these tools is to narrow down the information that the humans have to process. And then finally, my last example is graph networks. So we can pull together really disparate pieces of information that can actually uncover across millions of data points, the largest organized crime groups that might be trafficking dozens or even hundreds of trains nationally. And so it was these types of AI capabilities in Traffic Jam that helped Detective Patterson uncover the full scope of Julian's operation and the victims he exploited. Our technology gave Detective Patterson access to exactly the types of insights he needed to take down that violent trafficker, Julian. Detective Patterson used Traffic Jam and he began to uncover this larger network of victims than he ever expected. With the help of our technology, Detective Patterson identified a total of 21 victims that had been exploited by Julian. And the detective pulled together a case against Julian in three months that typically would have taken two years. And now Julian is looking at life in prison. AI made the nearly impossible possible. And a lot of times, you know, of course, our goal is to empower getting the bad guy. And that's kind of what we seek to do. But we also sometimes get to hear stories of victim success as well. So Ali is doing really hear stories of victim success as well. So Ali is doing really well. She's thriving in college now. And she's just doing extremely well when she was able to escape her trafficker. So we're really proud of this impact that we've made, but on this slide, I just wanted to share some of the challenges that we hit along the way, because it was not an easy journey. Um, and hopefully you can take away some advice for your own tech journey. So the first was diving into tech as a newbie. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I was a college student and I was a humanity student and I had only one programming class under my belt. It was enough to understand that programming was not magic and that there's rules to it and it's a language like Marita said, but I didn't have a deep experience with technology. And so first of all, I encourage you to take advantage of all the available tech education resources and the free courses that Cisco offers because it never hurts to have more 
information and education. And the more education you get, the more you'll be able to tell what areas you're really interested in. Uh, but even though I was jumping in with kind of jumping into a completely new area for me, I was, for instance, in terminal when I was working as a researcher, I was in terminal and the other researchers gave me some commands in terminal that I could use to interact with the data. And that was really helpful to that process of reverse engineering. You know, how does a detective need to get insights out of this data? So my first takeaway for you is don't be afraid to jump into something even if you don't know exactly what you're doing. Don't let those hurdles stop you from trying. And in fact, a lot of the trying just results in a lot faster learning. That's how you're gonna learn. So don't be afraid to jump in. And then in terms of the technology that, that we deploy, Traffic Jam, a big challenge that we've always had and probably will always have is making artificial intelligence and advanced technology accessible to the average person. So one story that comes to mind, one memory is that early on when we were interviewing detectives, you know, a huge part of, like Marita said, building technology is talking to your users. What do you need? What pain points and problems do you have and how do we help solve them? We asked the detective at one point about a specific case and he turns to his shelf and pulled a huge physical binder off of the shelf stuffed full of paper to show us about his case. And it really made me realize, wow, okay, some of our users are not extremely tech savvy and they may have a lot of their case information in physical form. And so it was really important to understanding the situation of our users and how to bring value at the point that they were at while also helping them to grow their skills in interacting with technology and making technology that was accessible to them. And so, Another piece of that beyond understanding the pain points and really being like on the ground with them, understanding how are you actually working? What is your process? Um, another piece of that was the UI. Obviously, we needed to partner and work with people and bring people on our team who did great UI programming. So I encourage you if UI design and UX design is of interest to you, uh, especially when it comes to social impact issues, it's really crucial to making the software easier to use. And the way I think about it is when I was working at the lab, we had programmers and postdocs and researchers developing some of the most advanced AI existing in the world. But my perspective from the social impact side was if it's not making a difference in the world, you know, who cares? But to me, who cares? You know, we want it to actually impact people's lives. And so the ability to communicate about these things, that's really been kind of my main job this whole time is to be an evangelist and spread the word, um, but also being able to make these tools easy to use. So one of the things I'm really proud of with Traffic Jam is when people log in, you know, we've asked a ton of questions about usability and they've said, you know, it's really, I feel like I can jump in and just start using it without too much training. So that's really, really important for us. And then kind of related to that, is my final challenge, which is still a challenge for us and a challenge for the, the industry at large is explainability of AI. So our detectives, we don't expect them to be AI or machine learning experts to use these tools, right? That's not their job, but it's important that they know enough about how it works to understand that it's not magic and also to understand that no matter how advanced technology gets, it's still their human responsibility to use their expertise, use the tools in an ethical way. And so part of how we do that is through training around how, the, how to use these tools, um, you know, cases where if the AI gives you a lead, you need to corroborate it against other evidence from the case um, and things like that. And then another part beyond training that we found to be really useful in explaining the technology is elements of visualizations in the tool that can help the users understand what's going on behind the AI. So for example, I mentioned graph databases earlier. They can kind of create these social network graphs of connections that will pull together disparate pieces of information so that, for instance, uh, users can identify organized crime groups that have potentially thousands of data points linked together. But when you connect that data, it can be often confusing 
about, you know, how did this data get connected or why are, is this phone number linked to this phone number? And it's important that they understand that. And so we, in the last year or so, have implemented node graph visualizations into traffic jams so that the user can actually see uh, the connections and better able to understand why the connections are what they are. So what's next? Well, there is so much more to do and Traffic Jam and our work with Traffic Jam has been so far focused mainly around kind of a reactive response to crime and exploitation. So obviously we try to shift, you know, the, the space to be more proactive, but the most often cases are that a detective gets a missing child notification or, you know, a family comes out and says our, our sister is missing, we think she's trafficked. Um, and we wanted to expand our perspective to prevention as well. How do we not just respond and have a good reaction to crime, but how do we help prevent it? So this includes expansion into these two new areas. The first being cyber fraud. So uh, kind of in short, when we were looking into this issue of uh, human trafficking online, in the hundreds of thousands of ads that we see every day, it's a lot of data, we actually just hit a uh, half a billion data points in our system uh, like yesterday. So it's a lot of data, but we started to see fraudulent activity that looks like phishing scams where people are kind of coerced into putting their credit card information into a kind of spammy web page and steal their information and steal their money. And so we're currently using chatbots and graph networks to identify the largest criminal networks exploiting people via these cyber fraud scams online. It's a very lucrative industry and a very lucrative way for organized crime groups to make their money. And then finally, child welfare. You know, when we think about human trafficking cases, the foster care system and children who are in child welfare it, it's all connected because those children often may interact with the child welfare system and then go on to be exploited later in their lives. And so it's really important that social workers uh, have the best tools to respond to these issues. And so we saw a need to help social workers and human services agencies get insights out of their data, which is thousands of pages of case notes that these social workers take in the field. So we're currently building tools using things like sentiment analysis and topic modeling to help them get the most out of this unstructured data so they can better serve their families and help prevent exploitative or abusive situations before they even start. So on my final slide, I just wanna thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Uh, you can connect with me on socials after this if you'd like to. And if you're interested in women leaders and CEOs, you can check out my podcast, The Empower Podcast, where I interview awesome ladies who are changing the world in, in business and it's really fun. So uh, looking forward to the discussion and thanks today, handing back to you. Thank you. Um, just you know, one big observation I have, I haven't made, but one that I'll talk about right now is that um, both Marita and Emily are solving problems, but they're coming at it from a different perspective. So Marita is interested in the technology um, and looking at ways to apply it that have a big impact on people. Uh, whereas Emily came at it from a topic that she had a passion about solving a certain issue, and then she found the technology. And what's beautiful about the two of you uh, together speaking today shows the breadth and the continuum that you can come at it from a different perspective. But the goal is, is being fluent uh, in, in some degree of technology, so you feel comfortable looking at things you don't know, uh, because technology evolves constantly, and the constant is, is that how do I continue to explore and be curious? So thank you for that, both of you. So I've been going through um, some of the questions that are coming up. Um, uh, Emily, you just finished. I'm going to ask you the first question, which is, um, uh, as you talk about this technology, uh, and I just mentioned that it's constantly evolving. Uh, you have to believe that uh, the people you're trying to catch are getting smarter uh, and adapting. So are they getting tech savvy? And do you find yourself thinking that it's hard to keep up with? And the second part of it is, is can you share how many people that you've impacted? Sure. Um, so yeah, how do we keep up with the tech innovation? That is a, a problem that uh, we started this work knowing. 
So uh, we knew that, uh, you know, we knew that the reason that detectives were falling behind on these investigations were because they didn't have the ability to innovate as quickly as the criminals. And the criminals actually, as with other criminal areas, uh, tend to innovate pretty quickly. They innovate as quickly as they need to. Um, and so they're out there finding the tools that they need to use to do what they do better to exploit people more effectively to make more money. And so that is a challenge that we've been aware of since the very beginning. And honestly, it's one that kind of is what spurs me on to do what we do because it's such an interesting kind of chase that your work is never over. And so we know that that, that is always continuing and our really main mission is to keep law enforcement on the cutting edge of these tools. Um, because like I said before, you know, they're not AI experts. They don't have the time to build an app or build software. And so that's the role that we want to play with them. And uh, with our most recent numbers, uh, the most recent numbers we have is in the last two years, we assisted in the recovery of 6,800 victims. Um, and so it's a very complex issue, you know, of, of how these victims do after they're recovered. And, and that's a whole nother conversation of victim services and other things that are needed to make this whole thing work. Uh, but yeah, those are some of our success numbers. Great. Uh, so uh, the other observation I have here that I think is really important is, is that innovation ideas come from individuals, products and solutions come from teams. Uh, which is something that is very important that we've seen and all, all of us have seen in our careers. And so this question is from Marita. Um, the first question is, is, um, you know, how are you funded? Because Emily is probably funded through revenue that comes from, um, you know, the law enforcement who uses it. So Marita, uh, the, Trish, the question came from Trish and she said, she asked, how are you funded? Sure. Well, um, with RoboGals, we're funded by um, sponsors, so corporate sponsors, companies, um, and um, with with iPoly, we um, we have a freemium model with the app, and so um, people can download it for free. But then, if you want more features, um, you can also be paid to do that. Um, and then iPoly um, like has it has expanded and created new services and. Um, and now the rest of the team is in Europe uh, working on cancer research. Um, and uh, as for my robotics company, um, we were funded by by grants and partnerships uh, and then um, and then through the sale of our robots um, and the sale of our telepresence robots um, has meant that we can do other projects and build other robots. OK, great. Uh, the other thing that I noticed for both of you is um, the networking aspect, right? I mean, we, we, you hear about networking, 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 go network, go network. Um, but there are people who are introverts and terrified of networking. Um, and I, uh, I see both of you, you know, you're in groups and you're working on teams, um, but could each of you explain, and I'll start with you this, Marita. I mean, every picture of you is you with a, a billion people. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I'm, I'm probably sure that you probably have met a billion people at this point with all your travels. You know, how do you just start up something and, you know, just, uh, you know, how, what would, would your advice be to somebody who is an introvert? Um, do you have any tips on that? Sure. Well, I mean, when I was in high school, no one really saw me as a leader um, or in primary school. I, I like put my hand up for like student leadership and all those positions and I, I was never selected. So um, and then like I try and lead a team at camp and and we just wouldn't achieve the objective. Um, and and so like I was never seen as a leader. And um, it was when I went to university and I just thought, you know, I want to do something. And I just had this like vision for what I wanted to do. And I talked to people and listened to people and and respected their ideas and what they wanted to do and um, and we came up with plans to to get things done. Um, and so yeah, I, I mean, I, I was never recognized as a leader growing up, and and now like you know started all these things. So I, I think it just goes to show that like if you even if you don't have the skills, if you just have this driving passion to create change or make something happen and people see that passion and um and they get excited by it and so they 
offer their skills and they offer their time in order to partner with you um, to create the thing so that they can be excited and passionate about about their work as well. Um, and so um, I, I think like, yeah, if you want to, um, I mean, if I if I tried to do all my projects by myself, I wouldn't have been able to get anything done. Uh, it's just too hard. And so you, if, I think if you want to achieve something really, really great, you do need to be able to work with others and um, in order to make something happen. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I still think that I'm, um, I, I think now with my networking, I, um, it, it's not, uh, it, I mean, it didn't come easily to me at the beginning, but um, I, I would just like, you know, swallow, swallow my um, nervousness and, and think, and think, you know, I have, I, I want to make this project happen. And if I want to make this happen, I need to talk to people. I need to um, get other people excited about it. And so that, that was the thing that inspired me to talk to people, um, making the project happen, getting the, getting the robots out to the world, getting the girls excited about engineering. So I guess, yeah, making it not about you and focusing on something that excites you um, can help you get out of your shell. So th that's a great example. And actually it leads to, um, Emily, an observation I've had with you is you actually um, approached it differently, which is that you asked your, you network with your customers, um, you know, with the law enforcement. So can you talk a little bit about, because that might be an easier way for people who are terrified of walking into a group and saying, hey, let's work on a project. I mean, what we saw with Marita was persistence and resilience and some tears and early failures and not being picked. I think that that's a common theme for most people. You know, when you see a leader up here, you think that everything went smoothly for them and that did not. And that's one of the things that both of our speakers were very clear about sharing. Uh, but Emily, your approach was a little different in networking. And can you talk a little bit about how that continues to enable you to build your business? Yeah, absolutely. I think I kind of approached because for me too, Tay, networking was a scary word. It's very intimidating. Um, and so for me, it was approaching detectives almost more from an anthropologist standpoint. Like this is a new world to me. I am not a law enforcement agent, but I'm really curious about the work that they do and learning not just the nuts and bolts of how they do their work, but what is the culture? What is the way that they work together, the way that they speak. And so I just kind of a funny story. I remember walking into my first big law enforcement presentation. It was at the Los Angeles Police Department Detective Symposium. And I was presenting, it was about an, uh, a year after I had graduated, I was presenting our prototype traffic jam. And I had this full brand new full suit. And I walked into the room and I was, uh, you know, about 22 at the time, and I looked nothing like anyone else in the room. And I remember the detectives in the audience looking at me like, what are you doing here? What, <laughs> what brought you here? And then I just walked to the front of the class and started my presentation, started teaching. And so I think part of it was knowing, hey, I think we have value to bring that's new. And that's really why I'm here and kind of being confident in that. But also there's a humility with, let me understand how you work. Let me be curious. I, I would say that's probably my best piece of advice with any networking is be curious, ask lots of questions, be thoughtful. And I think people really like when they realize, wow, you wanna learn about what I do and you're interested in what I do. And so it took a good amount of time, I mean, years to build those relationships and also the comfort level with our users and that, them being comfortable with me and trusting me. And so a lot of that takes time, but I think it builds amazing customer loyalty. Um, and I would say that be curious applies even with people who you're really intimidated by. Like I have found myself in one-on-ones with, you know, executives of big companies like Cisco and being very terrified of that. And what I found was it was so much easier when I approached it instead of what can I get out of this situation or what is my agenda um, to approach it more with curiosity and just learning about them and their background and how they got to where they are and what they're interested in. And that kind of takes the pressure off of you to like perform in some way, but you can really be yourself when you're learning about them as a person. So that would be my advice for that. Okay, I am so sad because this this conversation is coming to a close. 
Um, I would like to, to thank both of our speakers, Marita and Emily, and to all the people who have attended here. What I would say to you is every single person in this um, you know, forum and in friends, you could all be an Emily or a Marita, just your own version of them. So I'm going to end this with a quote from a gentleman. It said, and I'll paraphrase a little bit. Um, he said that it's always women that change the world in unique perspectives. After listening to all speakers as a guy, I'm just overwhelmed by the sheer knowledge. So thank you for that comment. Um, but again, anyone could be your own special version of Emily and Marita. So thank you so much for attending. And you will see the, uh, the scan codes, the QR codes. Uh, please put in the survey for your virtual gift bag. Don't forget the free online courses from Network Academy. Just out of curiosity, you might find something that really uh, you know, sparks a passion in you. And last but not least, uh, if you, you know, enroll in your personal career pa uh, passports, you'll be able to attend you know, five different sessions. And if you do that, you'll get an avatar and then uh, be put in a raffle and the winner will have an opportunity to have a backstage pass virtually and meet one of the amazing speakers that we have in this series. So thank you very much. And thank you uh, to Caroline and the entire team who make this possible uh, in IT, as well as to Emma, Jana, and your teams. And thank you so much, uh, Marita and Emily. Have a great day or evening wherever you are.